Right. No, because you're so good. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, we are live. This will not go well because there's dogs <laughs> in the room. Thank you, Patrick. Good evening, everybody. What a pleasure to see such a big crowd this evening. Thank you very much for coming out, and thank you, our virtual audience, for watching this, wherever you happen to be, anywhere in the world. We often get questions from Australia or where? Bucharest. We have a regular in Genoa. If you're watching, Stefania, it's very nice to see you tonight. I convinced there are people all over the world who go to bed in the daytime and stay up all night to do this. So this is our... Um, event for Moonfall, which is the second uh, in this series. And Jim, why don't we start by saying, why do you call it Moonfall? Uh, well, the, the basic big thread of this novel, is the, the story takes place in a, a tidally locked planet. For those that didn't attend my first, how many people were here the first time? How many people were, so not, many people haven't been here before. But those that haven't read the series at all, it, it takes place on a tidally locked planet which uh, basically means one, it circles the sun with one side always facing the sun, so it's you know, burnt to a crisp. The other side's uh, always away from the sun, so it's eternally cold and, and you know, shrouded in ice. And the uh, livable climb between those two extremes is what's called the crown. It circles the, between, the, the, between ice and fire. But uh, the story begins in the first book uh, where a, a woman has, a young girl has a prophecy of the moon crashing and destroying the planet. Um, that just then is to figure out, is, is that prophecy true? Uh, and if so, how in a medieval sort of structured society could you stop the moon from crashing into the planet? And that becomes a big quest, uh, putting together a, a team to try to figure out uh, how to stop that from happening. In a nutshell. So the first one, called The Starless Crown, um, had a very different look to it. I've been telling Jim, because I've been watching him signing it all day, what a really gorgeous cover I think this is. And you can see that we're going to a part of the planet that's cold, given all of this. And I was saying to Jim that uh, it reminds me, um, to some degree, of the opening of The Last Odyssey. For those of you who remember the Sigma Force before last, most recent one, Kingdom of Bones, went to Africa. But the one before had those great opening scenes in Greenland. And I asked Jim if he had used his, you know, time. You actually went to Greenland, yeah. right? Yep. Um, his time in Greenland to, to conceive of what the ice part of this planet would be. And one of the great things also about the book are the maps. So tell us a bit about the maps, because they're really very useful in us visualizing this world you've created. How many people got my newsletter? A few hands. So in the, in the newsletter I sent out, I showed the, the, uh, the evolution of the map from the first, my mm -hmm. version of the map, which looks like a third grader drew it, and that's probably insulting the third grader. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I gave it to a, a wonderful uh, graphic artist uh, who specialized in cartography that I met online, and she was able to render it into this into the, the beautiful maps that you see in there, uh, both the crown, but on this side you see some maps of the ice side. The the third book that's coming out will have maps of the of the uh, the sun blasted side. So it's a great deal of fun to to take things. You know, basically I, I didn't want to just create a, a pure fantastical novel. I sort of describe this as a scientific fantasy because I, I try to make it as realistic as I could. Um, when I first had this idea for the story, it, it wasn't necessarily going to be a fantasy. I read a Scientific American article about tidally locked planets, and I was curious about tidally locked planets. I thought, you know, I'm wondering if life could actually exist on that planet. So I, I talked to some astrophysicists, and I said, hey, could life actually exist in a planet of such extremes? And they said, well, actually, probably so, because of the, the thermodynamics of, of movement of air from one hot side to the cold side and the cold side to the hot side, there's going to be a little sort of pump that occurs. And there probably is a, a relatively temperate band between those two extremes, so and life could theoretically exist between those two extremes. I thought, well, that's cool. Now, me being a veterinarian and, you know, with a background in biology, I'm thinking, well, what, what might live there? So I began to work in the maps and creating different environmental niches and then trying to figure out evolutionary-wise what might live there. I just don't want a, you know, a dragon sitting on a mountaintop because that's where dragons live. I wanted to, to make sense that this is a creature that would live in this environment. So then I talked to xenobiologists and, and talked to them about uh, comparing notes, basically, on what creatures might live in these extremes. And then I worked with also in this, besides the, the maps, you'll see a page, I should have marked a page, but there's, a, there's biological sketches of some of the creatures you see in here. And I worked with another graphic artist who um, also has a background in biology. 
And between her, uh, she, she challenged me too, because I had just basic crude descriptions in the book, uh, leave it to your own imagination, some of the details. But of course, when she's drawing that, she needs to know every detail. You know, how is that claw curved? You know, what is that length of that tail? What's the, you know, the, how wide are those nostrils on that creature? And then we talked about why, you know, that the claws might be curved. Well, it's, it's an arboreal type of creature, so maybe it's going to have a prehensile tail and, and hook claws versus just regular claws in a, in, a, in, a, in a regular tail. So she helped, you know, going back and forth with a graphic designer, helped also hone, you know, what it was what these creatures looked like. So it was a great deal of fun to to build that world, both of the maps from the working with the different graphic artists. I can hardly believe that you've given me a chance to say Yellowstone tonight. <laughs> For those of you who weren't here, when Jim came with one of his books, some of you were here, right? And I ruined the whole thing uh, by talking about Yellowstone, I which I did. I know. So Yellowstone, <laughs> just anyway, there are extremophobes that will tell them about it. You can let him go. I don't, you don't have to hold on to your Alicia on your foot. Oh, I thought that was for me to hold. She's, no, it's I okay. I don't think me. he'll. I don't think he'll go anywhere. All right. If he does, I'll chase him. There we go. You're free. <laughs> <laughs> what was the oh, extreme files? Extreme. Well, because they, if you, if they're real on this world, then you're imagining it's, them exactly. on another I mean, world. Makes sense. In the Sigma novels, we've had Sigma Force Grin Company have gone into strange environments where, again, I got to play with my biological toolbox and build weird type of environments on the planet Earth and then, you know, try to populate it with different types of beasties that would make sense from a biological standpoint. So this is just done on, in, in a fantastical landscape in a, in, a, in a fantasy novel. But basically I'm following the same rules I was doing when I was creating the exotic, like, exotic uh, lands and climates and uh, geologies of uh, the Sigma universe. So when you say tidally locked, isn't there an assumption, therefore, that there's water? On the planet, or do tidally you locked means basically it's like the moon is tidally locked around our planet. Oh, so okay. The, the so it's not is, water; it's the moon. Is, it, it's uh, actually it's it's uh, it's not either. It's just the the forces of, of gravity and mass that's between the, the between the planet and these and the sun. Okay, so basically the planet's not rotating on its axis. I'm not telling you anything. <laughs> it's the, too late for me to why this, <laughs> this, some of the details of why that's happened. And, ah, how many people? How many people have read the, have not read the first book? Okay, well. Okay, we won't go into it then. Right. Because there's a very poorly kept secret. I mean, the planet's named Earth. But I it's Earth e with e a U. U U R T H. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's probably our planet. So I'm not ruining anything. It's I think I think most people figure it out on like by page six. <laughs> it's confirmed later on for sure, but but initially it's uh it's 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 not a poorly kept secret. So uh, the question of be, being a scientific fan is there's a reason why the Earth has stopped spinning. And there's a way they're going to get to start spinning again, but it's all based on science, not just magic. But there's some magic in the book, too. So if we have a national crisis or rather an international crisis, you'll be able to fix it with the yeah. knowledge that you've gained. I, I like the fact that just recently we learned that the, the core of the planet has stopped spinning just in time for Cradle of Ice to come out. <laughs> Love it. So when the book opens, because we're just here in the very opening pages, I, I said to Jim, I feel as though I've embarked on a voyage to Antarctica. So you have a really dramatic voyage going on. So tell us about yeah, it. I mean, basically, it, the, the second book deals with the excursion of the characters going into the frozen half of the world. Uh, book three, they'll be more on the, 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 the sunblasted side. Again, those that survive this. It's a, you mean if anyone survives it? it yes, yeah, it's not. It's a... Don't get attached into the characters. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Things happen. But yeah, so it's basically it's a it's it's a, a big adventure out into the ice world in one half of the story. The other half of the story uh, follows a, a second-born prince who's in exile from his kingdom, uh, who's been accused of, of of being a traitor to the kingdom, and he's gone to the neighboring empire uh, to try to enlist their aid and in, and in, in deal with this world-ending crisis that nobody seems to believe except for this team. So uh, there's the story told in two different viewpoints. One is set in the crown with Prince Camp. The other one is with Nix and her uh, uh, mere bat, Bashilia, and their their team uh, heading out into the uh, into the ice, the frozen wastes of the ice. So when you say second-born prince, are you actually saying spare? Pretty much. I mean, they, 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 I know it's a topical joke at the moment, but nonetheless, yeah. I can't resist it. Well, they, his, the nickname of Prince Kanth is, is the Prince in the Cupboard, is, is what he's derived. Or they, they, basically, he's a humiliating little title I give him, the Prince of the Cupboard, because basically he's the prince that's only kept in the cupboard 
just in case something happens to the the, the real prince that's de- destined to be. So the he king. is the spare. But he's the spare. So, Definitely. So he has a little resentment about that, and he's born twin. He's born just minutes late, you know, from become, becoming the king. So. Resentment appears to be a fairly common emotion for spares. Apparently. <laughs> So he's quite embittered and, you know, the beginning of Starless Crown, he's, you know, a bit of a drunkard and he's trying to live up to his uh, uh, lowly status a little bit. And, you know, it's him coming to, to his own in the, in the first book. And then in the second book, he has to you know, start assuming the mantle of something that he, he can't deny anymore. I can't say anything. I want to tell you stuff. What happens is... <laughs> So, how are they traveling in this? Lots opening? of big surprises in this book. That's all I'll say. Huge surprises. I mean, I have a critique group, and they were like, when I when I turned in that section, they were like, oh my! <laughs> they were like, they called me up and said, I can't believe you just did that. Well, you know, that's that's my goal is to to startle you. It's your story. You can do anything exactly. you want with it. Anyway, tell us about, you know, because they're traveling in, a, in an interesting way. We can at least talk about that because we're not going to spoil anything. Yeah, the, the means of transportation within this world right. is they they're, they have uh, the ability to produce a gas that can, t- can create these. So basically it's a Zeppelin type of ships right. that can travel the world. And they use those two those two rivers, those, those two uh, climate rivers that are very strongly used that to flow between the two sides of the, of the crown. So what? Uh, so those yeah. of you who know anything about zeppelins know that zeppelins can be fragile and subject to fire. So how how is this Which machine powered? Happens by in chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking to chapter one, but yeah, so I did think disasters happens aboard that ship mm, while right. while in the middle of the frozen lands. So what I mean, I was interested in why why forges? Are these people um, how advanced are they that they would actually have to have a, a forge with fire to to propel the ship instead of, like, say, electricity. Well, because there's an alchemist in this planet, and they've developed a, what's called flash burn. It's sort of a, a very potent version of gasoline that they use to, fi- to, to basically create little little um, jets associated with it so they can maneuver their, their crafts. So it's all a bit of alchemy, a bit of steampunk type of technology. Well, when you're making up a world, you can do anything you want with it, right? So you can make it. I've always found it so interesting that some of the big fantasies like Lord of the Rings, why is it that with all the sophisticated, I'm trying to think what else I saw that I could apply that to, with all the sophisticated stuff they've got in magic, they're still basically medieval. You know, they're still wandering around looking like they strolled into the, like a frost fair on the Thames or something in 1500. And, you know, it doesn't really jive with the, that's true. Phenomenal yeah. technology. So did you decide that you were going to do an upgrade from that, or did you want them to appear to be more rustic Again, just, than they need to be, or I what? I wanted to try to balance them between, uh, you know, if you were at a certain level of society and dealing with those extremes, and you were dealing with a society that was fairly repressive uh, and controlling the reins of uh, scientific knowledge, mm-hmm. which is a part of the, one of the themes is there's a... Uh, one of the villains of the story is trying to wrest the, the, the reins of scientific knowledge from everybody else. He wants to possess it for himself for power and for knowledge. And uh, so in that environment, I tried to you know, just have a little bit of balance between the beginning or beginning of technology in this world. At the same time, people are trying to repress it just because they don't want that power causing a sh- that They don't want the technology causing a shift in power. So... Well, I mean, one of the big debates going on in the real world is, you know, is there life on other planets and is the whatever if the thing is called that's out there with it, the Hubble, is that it? The Not the Hubble. Hubble. What Hubble. is it called? The James, James Webb. Webb. Thank yep. you. You know, as is going farther out into the universe, the question is, are there any other habitable planets? Yeah, well, that gets answered in the next Sigma novel. Well, what they're looking for is what? CO2? Isn't that what it is? That they're, If there's CO2 somewhere in the... They're looking the, for all different types of biosignatures and right. signatures for looking for identifying evidence of life on other planets. But I can't go into too much. Like that's all about We'll talk about that in August when uh, the next Sigma novel comes out. All right, uh, all right. The so gist of that novel is, is you know... We have a date for the next Sigma Force novel, which be is August 15th, for those of you who want to take notes. We've already got that one worked out. I know. It's great. Um, but, no, I mean, I, it, the thing, you know, is that most of the time when you're... any of the scientific things and all, it's all... If we find creatures, they're either wildly weird or they're like us. And I've 
I don't know that we can even envision what kind of life form we might find yeah, on other planets. Yeah, different type of essays about what life would be like, and it most likely would be nothing that we we would recognize. Exactly. You know, probably at the at the baseline biological level of, of viruses, bacteria, there's probably some mim- mimicking that will occur, but uh, once you start seeing where that goes from, it's probably not going to look nothing like what we look like. So the advantage we Holy have... to that. Is we're, right. Well, but the thing is that we became sentient, and it's not necessarily true some that life us. anywhere else... Well, some of us, right? <laughs> Sorry. And it appears that's vanishing even as we talk here, but... Um, but that's not necessarily going to be true. If we find life forms on other planets, they may or may not be sentient. Oh yeah, I mean, there's a good, at this point, you know, that's the whole premise. I would mean, guess of uh, Star Trek is, uh, you know, going going different planets and dealing whether they're, whether they're sentient life there or not, and boldly go. Exactly. Right. Love it. Um, so, what can we talk about besides the first chapter? Nothing at all. <laughs> well, I'm just going to sit very quietly. <laughs> And just contemplate the cover. No, basically, uh, I'll answer some of the common questions that, that, uh, that if I don't answer it now, you're going to ask it anyways. Is, you know, early in my goal, first, why fantasy? Uh, okay. You know, I, James Rollins is known as the, the Scott O'Pace thriller writer of scientific uh, adventure novels. And uh, so why this? Uh, again, I think I gave a little bit of a gist that it came from an idea that was, I thought was going to be part of maybe the Sigma universe is dealing with a tidally locked planet. And I thought, you know, I don't know what to do with this. Do I make this a thriller to try to create a tidally locked planet? Does maybe something cause the Earth to stop spinning and that creates a big Sigma novel? Uh, or do I go way into the future where this has happened way in the, you know, millennia, 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 go into, into distant, faded history. And now we're dealing with what life looks like on this new generation of planet Earth that's not moving. And so I had both ideas in my head, which, which do I want to write? And so I wasn't sure. So I talked to my editor. I'm sorry, I talked to my agent. And I said, you know, I have these you know, two ideas of what to write. And, you know, whether it's top moon, the, the planet stops spinning, it the threatens that the moon's going to crash into the Earth, or I'm way into the future where this is going to happen. And he says, well, I represent a screenplay writer who just sold his script called Moonfall, the same same title as your series, so I suggest you do the fantasy. <laughs> so that became that. The other question I asked, which do you, again, it might seem to be a, sort of a, a weird departure, but early in my career, I, I was writing fantasies and thrillers every year. Right. And um, why don't you remind us under what name you wrote some of them? Well, to backtrack really, really quickly is you know I had a hard time selling my first thriller, Subterranean, forty nine different re- letters of rejection. Uh, which takes a long time to collect. In the meantime, I thought, well, maybe I'm not a thriller writer. I'm going to jump ship and write a different genre that I love to read, which is fantasy. Began working on a fantasy novel. Eventually, this uh, I find an agent who says, hey, I think I can sell your thriller. I said, well, you're wrong, because we have 49 other agents who say, basically, this, this is unpublishable, but good luck. And then I went ahead and within about a week went from unpublished to suddenly I had a, an offer for the thriller, and an offer for the fantasy. And suddenly I went from unpublished to having two different genres, two different publishing houses. And they both said, you know, we don't like your real name. Give us give us two pen names. Uh, so it's a poorly kept secret. James Rollins is not my real name. I shouldn't probably say that, it's, but it isn't. Writers are liars. We make, but you go to, you go well, to the copyright page. I can interrupt and there. tell you that it's so challenging that one time when Jim was coming over, you know how the weird time frame goes in Phoenix yes. right, right now? She keeps rubbing this so, in my face. So most of the time, Jim, can't tell Jim time. in California and we are on the same time, but during Mountain Standard Time, we're not. So Jim came over to do an event and thought he would take a nap. And so our event started, and there's no sign of Jim. So I went over to the Hotel Valley Ho. I knew where he was, and I asked for James Rollins. No, there's nobody here by that name. And then I went, oh, my God, that's right. <laughs> and I, I, you know, it took me forever to say, okay, C, Z, Y. Oh, they said. Yeah, you get the C, Z gets you more, most of the time. <laughs> right. That's all you really need. And so they woke him up. And yeah, I wasn't asleep. Came. I was in the shower at that oh, point. Oh, is that what it was? Okay. I just got, I, worked, I was working out at the gym, got in the shower, and I'd hear my phone ringing. I thought, who's, who's calling me? And I pick up the phone, and it's, it's you know, got shampoo in my hair, and it's Barbara. It's like, you know, Jim, laughing. You, you, <laughs> you're, you're due for this event. We're going to do, we're, we're going to do a, a, a broad, you had like a, a we went to like a we were doing like film thing. It wasn't the, wasn't a book event. We were doing something on, on uh, 
on video or something. I can't remember what it was. I very was remember that this. was that back in the old days back when I, old we days. went over to the studio and we exactly did. it was that okay. We actually did our first video event in 1995. So you know everybody says, oh, you handled Cola so well, and I said, no, actually we just got a better tool because Zoom is way better than live stream, which is way better than the other thing. But we have archives that go all the way back yeah. to 1995. So if you go see that. Why is Jim's hair soaking wet? <laughs> right. He was nervous, right? <laughs> right. Oh, you're on the move. Okay. You're going to look at everybody? Watch Good boy. Watch puppy. Right. It's a guard dog. Guard that author. Well, if he sends an unmistakable signal, I will ra race outside. <laughs> right. I don't know. As I said, he's never done this before, so I don't think he has any clue what the rules of the game are. But you're, you're very calm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but he's a good boy. Anyway, um, I've lost track now of where we were. You have a question? Yeah. See, that was gonna, that's what I was going to ask. That was a leading to. So it's a, I ended up with both theories, and uh, the answer is whatever I'm not writing at that time is what I love best. <laughs> so what I found is that when I'm writing uh, a thriller, I'm thinking, I've just painted Gray and Company or whoever into a corner. I have no idea how to get them out of that corner. I need a magic wand. And then when I'm in the fantasy, I'm thinking, I need a telephone and an airplane because I need to get these characters and this information from here to there, hence the flying ships. I needed a means of transportation of dealing with a global-sized yeah. fantasy novel. Uh, it would take them a long time on horse to go from one side of the planet to the other. So I needed a means of transportation that I need to create for this novel just to get the characters from point A to point B. How have you cracked the distance communication barrier? They, they don't only they, they can't really ha communicate very well. It's just one means of communication that this that's opens up very shortly, but it, it only occurs in this novel. I can't tell you what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. There's a means of long long means of communication, but it can't ruin that surprise either. You're not being totally of stage. Yeah, it's not magic either. There's a scientific basis for it. Hmm. Right. Um, maps. Let's go back to the maps because I really love the way that um, you have created this very cold world and you're sending people off into it. Even the, you can see it so well on the, you know, the even the sort of rocks there and so forth are, I think, is it glacier? Are they glacier covered or just rock rocks? Yeah, the glacier partial half of it's glacier covered, half of it's just raw, cold rock. Hang on a second. Hopefully you can appreciate it from a distance. But so when I was, when I was doing the map for the frozen half of the world, um, again, I didn't want to make it just pure fantasy. You know, the world has been decimated when the world st when the world stopped turning, became continent shifted, oceans changed, but the basic some structure is the same. So. You'll notice, in the, if you look at the map of the frozen waste, there's a, a spot called the mouth of the world and the crash. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of course, I have to have them. It can't just be a, it'd be a very boring story if it's like, there's more ice. And then they go to the next page. Oh, look, more ice. And it's even colder. Something had to happen. I need to have a place where they could have an adventure on this frozen half. Mm -hmm. So I needed an area that uh, possibly has a sort of a geothermal heating source that um, would allow life to possibly exist in, in that in that world. So if you look at that map and you might look at, gosh, there's a mountain level over here and just to the right of those mountains there's this big heated area that's quite large in volume between the mouth of the world and the and the crash. And uh, that's a uh, can you guess what I base that on? Yellowstone. Yellowstone. I was going to say another chance to say Yellowstone. I love it. So there's some <laughs> some matching. You'll find some geology that matches uh, you know our planet a little bit and Right. That world. At this planet, you have endowed it with oceans. Uh, there's oceans in the in the in the, uh, in the temperate area. There is oceans right. in that area, but yeah. the, this is just basically a lot of ice and something else. But I won't say what that is. So this is intended to be um, unusually not a trilogy, but a tetralogy. You don't often get a four book series instead of a two book series or a three book series. You get oh. duology. Wait, do I have that right? Duology, tetral. What's a quad? Is it a quad? I'm losing my Latin. What's four? Quadrology. Quad. Well, anyway, four is it's an four. is an unusual number for a series. So we're halfway through. 
with two to go. So when you're doing something like that, Jim, do you have to you have to consider the entire story arc? You, do you yes. know what's happening from book one through book four? Yes, I, I know. I know where each. I know the mini arcs of every of the, of the four installations. I know the bigger arc of where it's going to land. I don't necessarily know great detail about some of the stuff that happens between those, right. uh, those, those what I call my tent poles of the story. But the basic skeleton of the story, I, uh, both each of the four volumes of the book and of the entire arc of the series, I do know. So this is, although you might not think so, this is actually a lot longer than The Starless Crown. So how many words did you go up? A hundred and... So Starless Crown, I think, was, uh, it was just about 200,000 words. This is 250,000 words. So it's... <laughs> we we weren't going to discuss that. We're going to discuss that. <laughs> it is it is actually bigger than the Starless. Yeah, so Starless Crown. Crown is in page page count. Starless Crown is like five hundred fifty pages. It's six hundred fifty pages. Yeah, but the pages are thinner. Yes, they're thinner. So be careful. It's all about them. printing and you know how many yeah. books you can package in a box. It's all in economics. But yeah. so. I was what I wanted. What I wanted to use it as a you know, it's like right. tissue paper. You can blow your nose afterwards. Look at that. When we get to the sad oh, part, okay. just rip out that page. And so, do you think that people expect in an epic fantasy? Do they expect an epic, by I mean, grand, large story per book? Well, whenever I, I teach writing, I always say you should you should you should write what you love to read. Uh, so again, I love to read action adventure stories. I like the you know Michael Crichton scientific type of stories. So that became Sigma. But I also was an avid fantasy reader. And to me, I, you know, the, the longer the fantasy, the better. If there are multi-volumes in the series, all the better. So that's why I, I, I like that epic you know, doorstopper of a fantasy. So you know, if you look at my early fantasy books, same way. They're the, the doorstopper novels. And uh, so I just, it's what I love to... Uh, it's what I love to write, and I think there's a large audience in the fantasy world that that, ex, that, that wants to live in that world. At least that's the, my experience. When I beginning a fantasy novel, I want to be lost in that world. I want to spend time in that world, and I want to be transported to that world. That if I'm going to learn all about this world, I want to spend some time there. I don't want to like learn all about it and then get kicked out. I want to spend some time there. So. Right, but if the world is going to make any sense to the reader, you have to spend a fair amount of time setting it up. So, therefore, it's going to be a bigger story. It is. And that's it, a juggling act between uh, revealing what the world's uh, dynamics are like, yeah. uh, both from, a, you know, what's the religion, what's the government, you know, what's what's the sci where, what level of science, scientific advancement are we at? At the same time, you got to get this plot going. you got to get the characters developed. So there's a lot of balls you have to juggle and try to Well, there's a lot of well. stuff taking up space that generally if you're writing a thriller or something, you try to whittle down to yeah. the minimum. Right. Exactly. Well, you know, the, the goal of your, I can't remember who said this. I think this was Jeffrey Deaver. Said, oh, I don't know, I should, I think it was Jeffrey Deaver. He said that when you're reading like a mystery or a thriller, uh, the goal is to get to the end. Who did who did the killing? Who's the murderer? Or you who know, wins? Who, you know, how is the world saved? I think more with fantasy, of course, we do want to find out how things resolve, but at the same time, we want to enjoy that journey a little bit more. So. So as a writer, do you find it easier to write fantasy because you have more room, you don't have to constantly sort of prune it down? Or is it just a different, is it the same as writing Sigma in terms of effort on your part? They're, they're different beasts. <laughs> uh, what I found is that when, again, you know, I wrote Cradle of Ice and then I wrote uh, Tides of Fire uh, back to back, and they're very different means of writing. They almost I tried writing Sandstorm in one of my fantasies at, at once upon a time and it was almost like stripping my gears in my head, trying to go from one to book back and back and forth. But it's it's uh they each have their own challenges. Uh like with fantasy is that you have to keep judging how many weird words do I want you to have to learn. Do they use a spoon in this fantasy world? Do they call it a spoon, or is it called, you know, a, a, a slop feeder? Or, you know, it's so you have to keep thinking, you know, where's that balancing line between, you know, creating that this 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 uh, verisimilitude that this, you're in this fantasy landscape, but at the same time you're using uh, words that really shouldn't be in a fantasy landscape necessarily. So uh, that's a challenge, and then just. Uh, having to describe every little detail because I can say, you know, he went to, to a coffee shop down the street and you can all in your head sort of picture what that coffee shop is if I'm writing a thriller. 
well, I'm describing a, a you know this this tavern. I need to describe it in great detail. You know what's it like? How you know is it disheveled? What's it, so it what requires? A, it requires a lot more detail that need, that needs to be incorporated and thought about. So there there literally it takes me about the same time to write a page of this as it does take a page of the thriller. It's about it's still about the same. About it takes me an hour to write a double space page. Pretty much no matter what I'm writing, even though you think I don't have to. You know, when I'm writing the thriller, I got to check everything. Like, Tides of Fire takes place in, in uh, around Australia and Southeast Asia, um, and you know, you have to check every detail. Like, there's a flight. Well, you know, how many hours if they're driving that, you know, taking that jet from here to point A, and then have to calculate it out, and the wind speed velocity of a African sparrow, and then. Because uh, otherwise, you fans will write him really rude letters and say, "No, it didn't take that long." Or and then it again, took you have to assume people have been to some of these places, yep. so you have to make sure every detail is correct. You know, there's a couple of museums that take place in this next novel, and I have to make sure, like, you know, what's well, on the first floor of this museum, and and I've not been to this museum, so I'm going online trying to find a map to this museum, and or I'm calling somebody else and saying, you know, can I, you know, can you send me a brochure about this place? Uh, whereas the fantasy, you're making it all up theoretically, but at the same time, if they're working with horses, then you have to know your sort of horse tack correctly and, and things that make sense. And if you're if they're flying ships, you want to make sure that you're using the correct nautical terms for ships. And so there's some uh, education that has occurred even in. So what about names? Fantasy. Names are a subject I, we've talked about lately with a number of authors because there's real emotional freight with names. You probably all, each of you probably has a name that you don't like, probably based on some jerk that was called that. I'm not going to reveal mine. I did the other night, and then I was embarrassed because I thought maybe that person was actually in the room. And I've just said, you know. But um, so when you're when you're making up names in a fantasy that don't have to conform necessarily to you know the sorts of names that you sure. would put in a thriller, how do you go about that? Uh, a, I have to be able to pronounce it because I know I'm going to get the audio reader's note saying, you know, please pronounce all of these words. So I have to do that. But also, I, there's a, usually I'm trying to, to catch a flavor of that character in the name a little bit. Uh, just, you know, it's not just fantasy, but for like Gray, Grayson is gray because, you know, he sort of walks in line between extremes. So he's, you know, in that blurry line. Uh, Monk I stole because I'm a big Doc Savage fan. And so I borrowed Monk from the Doc Savage crew and brought him into Sigma. Um so everybody has this. Is, there's a reason why each name is what it is. It's just not necessarily. Well, sometimes it's just pulling it out of my butt. So <laughs> there's a there's a lot of names up there apparently. But but in a fantasy, don't you first have to establish an alphabet? I mean, you're going to have to stick with the same alphabet, right? Or nobody's going to be able to read it. You'll think you're reading Chaucer or something. So what you know, you have to stick with our alphabet. But you somewhat, yeah. You get well. Okay, if you have, you know, you can use runes or something mm -hmm. magical, and then you have to translate it, or what? Well, luckily, in the, the, there's epigraphs that open up each section, and, and I, I went to using Middle English to make them feel like they're these old... Oh, Chaucer um, was not a yeah. bad bad thing exactly. on my part, so there right? Was, there's a reason for that. Okay. And, and each of the landscapes do have their own societies, and there are uh, they're different characters. I, uh, again, there's clues. Andrew about some of the lettering that occurs in different types of, like one, like the Kingdom of Hallanday has a, d a slightly different uh, character set than the Empire does. Okay. And if you look at the character sets of those two the things, they're giving you a hint a little bit about uh, where in the, the real world this story is taking place. Okay, well, you're going to have dynastic names, yeah. surnames, and then, again, and then some of its first names. So, like, uh, then there's different nomenclatures for different societies. The Empire sort of has a different nomenclature on, on the, how they use, like, Mr. or Sir or Knight. That's different from what the Empire does. So, each society has their own sort of uh, honorifics that they use. So, how do you keep track of it all? Do you have some kind of um, there's a Bible Bible oh, that yeah. you've created for the series? And it's uh, <coughs> it's uh, I'm going to make you read it. No. <laughs> you could actually probably publish it at the end, but oh, it would be I mean, very boring. It would be fun. But yes, sir. Oh, sure. You talked about, I believe, the template. Yes. The yep. Are there times when you're going through that arc in those templates, and then oop, I got I want to put this, or I want to add this, or I want to add. Oh yeah. Template. That's why I try to keep it fairly. I keep my my um, outlines fairly skeletal. There's some pivotal points that I have to get to because uh, uh, there's, there are certain things that are going to have to... There's a, a phrase that, you know, uh, plan it early, pay it off later. 
when it comes to fiction writing and that you have to, certain things have to be set up, certain tent poles have to be in place for my resolution to the story to make sense. So those tent poles are, are there's certain ones that are inviolate. They're, they, they, they must be there. Other tent poles are, well, you know, if I get there, I get there. Um, but what happens between those tent poles, I don't know. Sometimes I don't I have no clue how they're going to go from point A to point B in, the, in this in this plot. And to me, that's the joy of writing is the discovery of that story. Uh, it allows the characters to motivate where they're going to go. A lot of times, uh, if I try to force a character that you know I haven't designed them that way or built them that way, they wouldn't act that way. And even if so, that that means I've got to shift things around a little bit to make to get to that pen, to that what? next tent pole. Um, in, in, in your writing, have you ever reached a point where you said? I gotta change how this this is gonna move. You probably need to repeat this. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, folks. <laughs> yeah, it's the question that is about the structuring the story and, and the fact that I build a skeletal outline and I set up some initial tent poles that that are and some of them like that are set in stone. I can't move them, otherwise the the ending is not going to make any sense. And at this point, I've written. I'm working on my 47th book and. Uh, I've landed almost every single book that I can think of has landed where I, I needed it to land. Uh, there's been no surprises uh, where it landed. Um, so I'm pretty, I stick pretty closely to that. Those immovable tent poles stay immovable. Other tent poles, they, they're not that critical to the story. So if, if they, it doesn't make sense to go there, then I won't go there. But I, the, the, I do need to get to that, that, that immovable tent pole at some point. Anybody else have a question? Sure. Yes. Um, Sometimes in, in the script, one of the characters will be speaking in their native tongue, and then you'll say it in English right after that. How did you derive the native tongue? For for this book? Uh -huh. um, again, there's some clues. <laughs> Andrew. Andrew, I don't know Andrew. Andrew, let me just tell you about Andrew. <laughs> so, uh, in, in, Andrew was just Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. No, there's a real Andrew. Yes, Andrew right there. In the oh, there is Andrew. Hi, Andrew. You're a real person, not a then. fantasy. He is the... Uh... From the first book, The Moonfall. Yes, I'm going to talk about Andrew. That will relate to what you're going to say. Okay. Or answer your answer, rather. So, uh, back in the past, I, I had uh, one of those inserts for one of the novels, and, and it, was, uh, it was one of my... Was, I can't remember which novel it was, even. Do you remember which novel it was? So it was, a, again, sort of a gothic fantasy, a gothic vampiric novel that I wrote. And I, I had this sort of code written out in this, this strange type of, 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 of script. And uh, I had a, a contest where I was going to say, well, whoever can solve that code first will give you a little prize. So, you know, passed out the inserts, thinking, well, it's going to take a couple months for somebody to figure it out. And like 10 minutes later, I think I solved it. <laughs> And he did. So, so when it comes to, again, to relating to, there's some clues in the language also about uh, where these places are. Some of you look at there's there are certain words that actually are, I'm not totally making up, they are from a certain language in, on this planet uh, that gives you a hint that, oh, well, this is where... So it could be from an actual language from... There is usually a basis, they're not just, it's not just pure, there's a underlying, a lot of it is made up. But uh, buried in there are some hints of well, the original language. Right. So basically, I'm I'm, I'm building a little bit of verisimilitude by because by having them, you know, if you're if you're from the kingdom and you go to the empire, the empire has their own terms for different things, and so when you're speaking to somebody from the empire, they're most likely going to use their term for that. So I'm just sort of using that as a way of, of giving a little hint to the reader about where the story originated from. Plus, I also like just making up languages. So it's fun to, you know, go back into my old German language classes and get my, uh, you know, noun verb, down, noun verb, uh, yep. thing. Declension. Now it may decline. Exactly. So yeah. German and Russian. So again, a big part of the Bible is making sure that, that that the language makes sense for each of those different lands. So before we leave Andrew behind, since Andrew is here, how did you luck into Andrew, or or maybe Andrew lucked into you? Uh, for when he just showed up at a signing and just kicked my butt with that solving that riddle. <laughs> he has, yeah. You have. Where do you travel, so to speak? You must. You what? 
Oh, so you've been to the signings here. Yeah. Okay, I thought for a dizzy moment you were tracking them around the country. Right. No, we don't have any stalkers. Do you know somebody said that to me once some years ago? Various authors said to me that we're the only bookstore they go to where there's no resident stalker. That's a really, that was before COVID, but nonetheless, I thought to myself afterward, now I know we have Andrew, so I'm going to give it a different answer. <laughs> Love it. I want a stalker. I'm still waiting for somebody to stalk me. Right. All right. Anybody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, basically, I was basing it on the ultrasonics of a bat, because the, the bat biology, uh, there's basically a, a sentinel that, uh, in the storyline, and uh, that were engineered long in the past to be biological s sentinels for the planet, to look for, to be there in case something happens. And there's also these mechanical sentinels that are also in place. And so there's like a biological and, and mechanical type of uh, combination to try to protect the planet after it stops spinning. Why? I'm not going to tell you. But... Uh, so I, I, I figure, well, how did they, again, from a scientific basis, how do they engineer these, these bats to, uh, to be able to use ultrasonics in such a manner? And what if, that, what if that gene that they engineered started to seep into the human population and certain humans started to develop the similar type of, of ultrasonic means of communication, uh, hence bridal song, that, developed, that creeps into the human population? <laughs> okay. One vote. A couple more. Come on. Okay. Or maybe you have to buy. Sorry. Maybe you have to buy the audio book in order to hear. You know, we go through life, don't we? Reading words and nobody's ever pronounced them in front of us, so we really just are taking a guess. And sometimes then we're surprised when we hear somebody say it. But would the audio book kind of solve that problem? The audio book reader for this is is uh, Nicola. I don't know, I'm not gonna last name. Uh, but oh my gosh, she is just beautiful. Her her ability to how she how she reads the novel is like, who wrote that? Because I didn't write that. That there's no way I wrote that. It sounds so beautiful when you're when you're saying it. I will never do a reading aloud myself, by the way, because it sounds horrible when I read. But it's just I listen, just heard the excerpts for her um, reading on Cradle of Ice, and it's just so beautiful. But one of the things I think that gives the Sigma Force books so much verisimilitude is that Jim travels to, you know, visit those places. One epic evening, we went out to dinner after one of these events, and Jim was rejecting all carbohydrates. And I said to him, what's all that about? And he wanted to go. Where were you going? Vietnam, to cave in Vietnam. To go caving. And in order to do that, he had to slim down so he didn't get, like, stuck in the cave. So, uh, no, I'm serious. You know, I tried it afterward, and I just, I found that I just couldn't manage without carbohydrates. <laughs> so I particularly admired your um, dedication to that. Well, I had, I had a, it was a carrot and the stick type of thing, is that I, I've been caving since, since college, and, you know, it's a sport I loved. But over time, it, it sort of, you know, I would still attend the, the, the grotto meetings where, you know, somebody would talk about caving in certain aspects out, out of San Francisco. And I was attending one of the meetings, and I hadn't caved like in about three or four years. And I was like 50-something at this point, and uh, my waistline was getting a little bit bigger, and my knees were getting a little creakier. And I'm thinking, well, caving's a young man's sport. You know, it's, it's a young, thin I'm, I'm man's gonna, sport. I'm going to stick to scuba diving because you can float. <laughs> and uh, so this gentleman was up there. He was describing his caving trip. And, you know, it was a very technical, uh, it was a very, very vertical cave and quite a lot of uh, rope work to be able to ascend and descend it. And he was giving, he had uh, maps and the, the cool pictures from it and very challenging. And I thought, I don't even know I could do that in my, in my, in my youth. It looks so hard. And this guy was 65. So I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm using this as an excuse of being 50. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to get back in shape and... So I needed, to, I needed a, a, that, that carrot. So there's a, a caving, a grotto, grotto, grotto sponsored caving trip to, to Vietnam. Uh, but I needed to be in shape for it. At that point, I was not. I was not ready to go to such an extreme hard cave. So uh, 
So when I travel, dive. when I travel, I take photographs of caves. When I was doing the Lower Danube, there's a really cool cave. I take photos and I send them to Jim. So try to keep him interested. Right, done that one. It's hard to find a cave he hasn't actually been into at this point. So when you did your um, Vietnam trip and all, did what book did that come in, or is that coming into the new book? It's coming a little bit in the new book. Um, there's a, uh, a section in Tides of Fire that takes place in a, a cavern system, but of course, the, you know, my my characters always would go underground. My, even my editor was like, "Are they going underground again, Jim?" Yeah, yes, they yeah. are. <laughs> there was that really terrible group of you know horrible thing when that group of kids got lost in a, or stranded in a cave. Was yeah. it in Thailand? Wasn't yeah, it? Thailand? Yep, that was a. a, a What's his name? I think Ron they Howard rescued all of them, if I remember correctly, but it was, you know, scary. Yep. That was what? The one of the rescuer. Oh. No, if you haven't seen the movie, Ron Howard did a movie that's really riveting uh, that tells that story. Yeah. It's very good. Anyone else? Have, Patrick, are there questions from the yeah, live out with the virtual? Working, kind of, sort of. Okay. Um, yes, there are a few questions that have come in. And let me see if I can. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Sorry, I was all set up and I lost my place here. Okay. No, I have not. Oh, it's, it's very, very cool. Karchner Caverns. I mean, it's not actual caves. Well, it's still, I enjoy show caves just as much as I. The, 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 the show caves are lots of fun. Different parts of the, of the year, you can't go in one side because that's where the bats live. Cool. Right. That's cool. Of course, that's why there's bats in. <laughs> in the story too, by the way. Okay, I like got it. So we're gonna put bath. Got, got it. Uh, Sean Hicks would like to know, um, as an author, how do you connect with professionals in the scientific and other fields to pick their brain about this stuff to make the novel as accurate as possible? So, uh, can, uh, do, do they hear that, or do I need to repeat the question, or with your microphone? Could they? Hear I think that? they could probably hear it online. Okay. Yeah. So the question, if you haven't heard it, was basically, is how do I, as an author, communicate with or get connections with the scientific community or the military community. I get that question asked a lot too. Um, is for the scientists, it's because uh, they love talking about their work and you know, their, their wives or husbands out there, they don't want to hear about it. Uh, <laughs> so when they have an avid audience of somebody that shows interest in their, in their specialty, they are very keen to, uh, to communicate. And uh, me is a, is writing a scientific thriller. It takes a long time to write a book as, as you, you know, tried the fire was completed. Well, almost a year ago, it's not coming out until until August. So there's a long lag time between when I get the idea, then I have to write it, then there's a editing editorial process, then there's a long lag time before it finally hits public hits the hits the shelf hits the shelves. And science changes very rapidly. Uh, so what might seem current or, or true when I begin a novel could theoretically change by the time the novel comes out. And uh, so I don't want that to happen. And so I, when I'm ever talking to the scientists, I'll, I'll do this uniform. I usually have at least one person that's willing to talk to me about whatever scientific aspect of, of this novel. Tides of Fire uh, deals with, uh, again, I mentioned before about uh, the search for uh, life on other planets. Um, so I talk to different scientists out there that are specialties, uh, specialists in those fields to get, again, the current, most current tools and technologies that they're using out there so that when my novel comes out that it feels current so i ask them you know don't tell me you know what was in your last uh journal article from three months ago or that book you're working on that's going to come out in a year tell me you know turn around tell me what's on your lab table right now because i need that level of immediacy so that when my novel comes out it still feels fresh and new and so a lot of times people will think, oh, well, John, Jim, you're, 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 you seem very uh, prescient about some of the science you bring up in novels. I read this in your novel. And listen, my editor does this all the time. I'll write something. And then like when the book comes out, you know, something comes out that's directly related to the, some discovery that was like, Jim, you had that in your novel already. Well, yeah, because I talked to that guy already. That's why it might seem like I'm predicting it, but no, he just told me. There's no forecasting. Exactly. Well, again, it's not, not hard to do. You, you can just go online and you just put xenobiologist and you'll find a, a list of publications. You'll find the university has a xenobiologist. You call it university and say, hey, is so-and-so still at university? Yes. Would, would he mind speaking? I'm an author working on a, a novel. Would he be willing to talk about his work? And they're usually, you know, nine times out of ten, they'll say yes. Occasionally they'll say, you know, no. sorry. But uh, 
Anything else, Patrick? Yeah, another question. Are there any other authors that are working in your field that you really enjoy? Other thriller writers? Oh, I mean, there's tons of them. I mean, again, Steve Barry is my friend of me. Uh, you know. <laughs> Steve Barry will actually be kicking off his new book here. Uh, when is it? Monday? The... Don't promote him. But you brought him up. And they've already bought your books, so you're perfectly safe. I'm trying to remember. No, I love, I love it's Monday the twenty first. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, we talked about Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child before. Uh, again, I was reading him. I remember, I was writing, well, writing Subterranean, which takes place it's a uh, you know two miles underneath Antarctica, and uh, I just finished it. I was trying to sell it and uh, having a hard time, and then I read Relic. I thought, oh. No wonder I'm not selling my book. This is so brilliant. And then I finally got subterranean. I got to, I found a home for it, and uh, it sold. And I wrote my second book, Excavation, and and Douglas Preston was kind enough to give me a blurb. So it was you know, really cool to have that. You know, I was just you know, reading his book, and now he's blurbing me, or Clive Cussler, for that matter. Um, so again, you know, I can go on and on with the authors I read that in the genre. Almost, and, and almost any thriller writer, I've read at least one or two books of almost everybody out there. Jim was actually, I have it right, the awards chairman, weren't you? For yeah. Thriller Fest for a long time, which meant that he had to read an enormous number of other thriller writers yeah. in order to sort all that out, right? Yep. Yep. Um, that it? Does somebody ever come out with a book and you say, damn, I wish I'd thought of that idea? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. And sometimes, uh, you know, what's even worse, though, is we do write the same book at the same time. Oh, yeah. That's... You know, sometimes that happens when there are events that spark off people's imagination, you know, more than one person because the event is significant enough. Well, well let's bring up Steve Barry. Again. <laughs> Again. The 21st. Hello. So I wrote this. <laughs> I wrote, uh, I can't, I've always got my books mixed up. What's the one that takes place in the Smithsonian where there's a, they burn it down? It's. Uh, Anyways, it deals with the history of the Smithsonian. For those that don't know Sigma, Sigma Force's uh, headquarters are, are beneath the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Castle right. on uh, the National Mall. And so uh, I've been collecting a bunch of information about the Smithsonian Castle because that's where Sigma is. So I've got all these history of the Smithsonian Castle and the Smithsonian Institution itself and had all these, these, these sheets and things and began working on the story uh, about uh, the history of the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian Castle that was going to play a, a part of the story. And then uh, I thought, well, gosh, you know, Steve has, works with the Smithsonian Library Association. I'm going to call him and get him some more details. So I said, you know, hey, Steve, I'm you know, halfway through this novel, and I'm working on the Smithsonian, you know, story. And he says, what are you doing? Well, you're doing what? I said, yeah, I'm doing, you know, Sigma's underneath the Smithsonian. That's the basis of my next novel. It says it's coming out in two months. I said, Steve, my character's in this. I own the Smithsonian. Just get out of that Smithsonian. Do you have characters in any of the Smithsonian? So, so we ended up having two books almost come out at the same time that all deal with the history of the Smithsonian. But very differently, very which, different, which yes. is one of the great things about books is you can do the same thing, but it all comes out differently. Yes, ma'am. It's a little bit of both. Uh, I mean, obviously, I have a contract, and there, there are built-in deadlines uh, for what, the, what they want when they want the books. But they don't necessarily tell me what the books are. They give me the freedom to figure out what that is. But and it changes. You know, initially, very early in my career, when Lisa, my editor, uh, had picked uh, Subterranean out and decided to publish it, um, she required me when I was whenever I was pitching her a story idea. She wanted a detailed outline. It was, you know. 20 page single space lay out every character every plot line every subplot line I want lay it all out and then I turned it in and she goes yeah that's a good story here's some money I, thank you and then I'd go home and go I don't like that idea anymore and so I read an entirely different novel and I turned it in and she goes this is nothing like the outline that you sent in so yeah, do you like it yeah I mean, shut up <laughs> so because when I wrote Map of Bones, it's not ruining this. It's not ruining anything. This happens in the prologue of Map of Bones. So don't worry, I'm, ruining, I'm not going to ruin the book. Uh, I woke up one Sunday morning. I'm a bit of a lapsed Catholic, and uh, I was uh, Sunday morning, and I thought, what if somebody poisoned the communion wafers at a church, 
and they got distributed, and then by the end of the church, everybody dies. End of the mass, everybody dies. I like the idea. It has nothing to do with the novel I just pitched, but I like that idea. I could see it in my head. Again, you know, so I'm gonna. So I uh, again sold that I, long idea to Lissa, but I came back to her and said, "Hey, I don't know where the story's leading, but I know you, you bought that. But think about this: What if somebody poisons the community away from the church and everybody dies? How cool is that?" And then give her a couple of the you know little plot points to go along with it, and then she goes, "Yeah, write that one instead." So sometimes even she's like, you know, forget that idea. This one's cooler. So a lot of it is just, you know, that dawn of an idea or that seed that gets planted that becomes a story. A lot of it is they can't actually hand over money unless they have some basis for it. So um, you do have to turn in some idea in order to get. Authors don't get paid all at once. You know, they get paid in stages, yep. right? Yep. Sometimes dragged out a long way. Yep. Um, but to get it going, you have to the editor has to believe that you're going to finish a book. That's why all debut novels um, are not, you have to turn in an entire book. If you're writing a first novel, they aren't going to buy it on 20 pages or an outline. You have to actually write the book to prove that you can do that. But after that, you can get away with um, quite a bit because they, they know that you can actually finish a book, right? Most times. I'll use this one example of the, the most... Uh and I, I've told this before because I know I've told this in this this room before about an author that just, uh, again, 49 different rejections, could not get this thing sold. I had completed the novel. But another author um, had written like the first 30 pages. It had never been published before. It's like the first 30 pages of the story. And he had a, a rough outline for the rest. But he had a wonderful log line for his novel. His log, log, log line for the novel was Jurassic Shark. So just those two words, pretty much you know what that book's going to be about. It's going to be like Jurassic Park, but with a giant man-eating shark. prehistoric shark. That became Meg. So based upon that 30 pages and yeah. that outline, those two-word log line, he sold the book, he sold the movie rights, but and he, sold his, so he bought like two sequels. So yeah. it does happen sometimes where you don't have to write the whole novel. Just have a really good log line. You can sell nonfiction on on that kind I of like thing. I like Steve Alton. Steve Alton is, by the way, yeah. should, should plug Steve Alton. He he wrote Meg. It's, it's a good book. Okay, novel. right. No, no, not yet. I was waiting to, but you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Tuck, for those who don't know, uh, Tucker uh, and Kane, they're a sort of dy dynamic duo. Uh, Tucker is a former army ranger who uh, is no longer with the service, but he sort of escaped with his military war dog, Kane. Um, Kane used to have a, uh, a litter mate, soulmate named Abel. Abel got killed. Tucker was upset. He took off with Kane. Uh, and they have first appeared in Bloodline. And then I spun them off and with uh, Grant Blackwood. We wrote a couple of standalones featuring that character. <laughs> they appeared again in Kingdom of Bones. Um, and they will again occur in the book After Tides of Fire, which I'm so coming up. Has anybody read Kingdom of Bones? Who gave me name suggestions? Just Andrew? Of course Andrew did. Well, the, uh, can't say anything. That will ruin the end of, tides, uh, ends of Kingdom of Bones if you haven't read Kingdom of Bones. So There's a little contest going on in the background that's tied to Kingdom of Bones. Anyone else? I keep waiting for a combustion here between the two dogs, but so far nothing has happened. They're slowly yes, sir. working their way towards each other. Uh, I'm a very fantasy expert. Yes. So I just wanted to say that the factor that makes them very fantasy authors is that you know, that they're directed by Taylor J. Um, Again, I read George R. R. Martin before he was ever... I read him when I was in high school, back when he was uh, doing... Uh, uh, Write more fan, more science fiction type of stuff, um, and uh, I remember I was writing my first. I had finished my first fantasy novel way back in the past. I was writing my second fantasy novel, and uh, I I got a copy of Game of Thrones, and I'm reading it, and you get to the scene where Jon Snow finds uh, Ghost, not Ghost, Ghost, just the name, uh, and the whole the whole litter of of of, of Dire wolves, and I thought this is just—I can't write this well. This is so frustrating. So I threw their book, first edition hardback, of Game of Thrones across the room in Australia, and I broke the spine. 
Ooh. of the book. And uh, so, again, big fan of the, uh, unbeknownst to me, and I had this conversation with George R. Martin at a panel once. Uh, so, you know, I finished my five book fantasy series and, you know, went on with life. And then I was reading the next uh, George R. R. Martin book and I realized, oh, my main character in the witch series comes from a little town called Winterfell. And so I was at the panel. I thought, I thought, I thought, George, I think I ripped off Winterfell and put Winterfell in my, in my book. He said, well, when did your book come out? Uh, it was like 1997. My book came out after that. So, so, <laughs> so that's, a, again. But uh, uh, I still read a lot of fantasy. There's, uh, I, I like Tad Williams. I read Tad Williams. Uh, Tad Williams I like a lot. Uh, Terry Brooks, I grew up reading Terry Brooks. Uh, he was the one that actually helped get my first nap fantasy novel sold. That's a great story, by the way. Have you told them that story? Maybe. Have you heard the Terry Brooks story? It's a great Everybody story. Everybody else has heard the Terry Brooks story. You have so heard the Terry Brooks story. <laughs> well, you had a lot of new people here tonight, so you can tell them that. Well, well these wind people up are with new. They are, they are they're close. You know, a couple more years, I can call them stalkers. <laughs> They're not quite there, but they're almost there. They'll be good-natured about it. It's a great story. Yes, I'm worried. Right, that's exactly. right. Exactly. But you got to earn your stripes. Puppy? Is he down there causing havoc? Oh. So the Terry Brooks story. Uh, so I mentioned before I was working on the thriller that I could not get sold. Uh, it, it takes a while to get the res those rejections. So during that time where I just thought, well, maybe I just, I'm not a thriller writer. I began working on the first book in the, in the Witchfire series. And uh, during the beginning of summer, I got that agent who said, hey, I think I can sell Subterranean. I said, well, good luck, lady, because, uh, you know, it was rejected 49 different times. But if you think it's not going to cost me anything, you know, have at it. And uh, so then she, over the summer, oh, she by the backtrack for just a second. She asked me when that phone call, she said, okay, Jim, I want to try to sell Subterranean, but will help me if you have a second book already in development. So it helps me to sort of have a proving that you're a writer. So what are you working on now? Well, so I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I'm about halfway through this fantasy novel. I'm really excited about it. And she goes, ugh. And she makes that noise. I can still repeat that. Ugh. It haunts me. I don't like fantasy. I don't read fantasy. I don't know any of the fantasy editors out there or the fantasy publishers. Stop writing that. Write me another thriller. And I'm thinking, I've got 49 different rejections. This agent wants to represent me, so I better do what she says. So I tell her, okay, I'll do that. I was lying. I had absolutely no intention to stop writing that fantasy because I was convinced she was never going to sell Subterranean. So also, the other inciting factor was that I had submitted the first couple chapters of, of Witchfire to a... Uh, Writers Conference, the Maui Writers Conference. See, you don't you heard the Maui Writers Conference story. See, now she's remembering it. So I submitted the, to the Maui Writers Conference, and uh, it's a big conference. It was at the end of summer. This was all occurring at the beginning of summer. I thought, well, I'm going to at least through the rest of summer finish this fantasy novel, and I'll see how uh, this editor does, or the agent does, in trying to sell my thriller. Over the course of summer, she began collecting her rejection letters from publishing houses. And I'm like, you know, because I have another rejection, Jim. My reaction was, told you so. It's unpublishable. I've got verifiable proof in writing. Uh, so end of summer comes. I go to the conference. Um, and this is my very first writer's conference. I'm very nervous. Again, unpublished. Going there to learn, you know, meet some people, talk shop. And the first night of the conference is a sort of a meet and greet tea. It's where all the attendees and conference members uh, can mingle in a big ballroom in Maui at the end of summer. That's important. They required met, uh, gentlemen to wear jackets. If you had like a little leather patch here, you get extra points. You could wear a Hawaiian shirt under there, but you had to wear a jacket because it's a literary event. Maui, end of summer, hot ballroom, wearing a jacket, not a good, didn't quite have all the bugs worked out of this conference yet. And so I'm, I go into this conference room, I mean, into the ballroom, and I would swear as soon as those doors open, everybody closes into little clicks and circles, and, and uh, I don't know what to do. I'm not a good conversationalist. I don't know how to break into a conversation. Do you sidle up to a group and go, I like dogs? And, 
and hope for the best. So I'm getting more and more nervous and uncomfortable and sweating through my jacket by this point. And I look across the room and I say, hey, you know, that guy over there, that's somebody I know from Sacramento. Not, 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 not you know, it's a friend of a friend, but that, that's enough of a connection. We're going to bond at the hip at this point because I need this. So I get across the ballroom and I clap this gentleman on the shoulder and say, what are you doing here? And he turns around, and this relates to the, the movie I just recommended. It's Ron Howard, the director. And without his hat, you know, he doesn't have a lot of hair up here like me. And uh, he looks a little bit like my friend from Sacramento, but he obviously is not. Uh, and he turns to me and goes, well, sir, I was invited. And I'm like, just checking. Make sure you're not crashing this party. So then I, you know, slink away, tail between my legs, and trying to get away from him. And I'm even more nervous, and I got to worry about, you know, Ron Howard's security coming after me, besides everything else. While I'm in retreat, I look across the room, and I see somebody else I recognize. Another person. That's Terry Brooks. If nothing else at this conference, I'm going to shake Terry Brooks's hand. I was a stalker. So I get up there, and this time I circle him a few times. I check the name tag. It was like Ron Howard in disguise. And you know, Mr. Brooks, you know, I've been reading since I was in junior high. I remember like you know, getting a sunburn because I didn't want to get out of the the, the, uh, the sun the w open window because it was just so I was so engrossed with the story, and and uh, just you know just an honor to meet you. And he looks down at me and goes, "Yeah, I'm a fan of yours too." I thought, "Oh, this is informative." Terry Brooks is an asshole. Did not know that. Why is he insulting an unknown, you know, person at this conference? And he goes, no, no, I, you know, you got a weird last name, sir. Because I was using my real last name. I recognize your last name, and I was one of the judges at this year's contest. I read your fantasy piece. I liked it so much, I invited my editor to come to the conference because he wanted to meet you. So based upon that personal introduction from Terry Brooks, I was offered a three-book fantasy deal. So I rushed to my room after that and I called my agent and said, you know, I think I sold my fantasy series. You know, would you help me? I don't know anything how to you know, structure contracts or anything like that. Will you help me, you know, make sure I don't get screwed over? So sure, I love fantasy. <laughs> that 15% engenders a lot of love from those agents. And she goes, by the way, I currently have uh, two publishing houses currently bidding for Subterranean. So that's how I ended up from going flying into Maui unpublished, flying out of Maui with two different publishing deals. So, and three different names. It got very confusing. Did you ever get a chance to talk to Ron Howard again? I don't think, I think I've just got a restraining order against me at this point. <laughs> I thought he'd figure back into the story, but. No. I, have, I have an issue with directors, apparently, as I was, I was at Comic-Con one year. I think I told this story, too, maybe not. Uh, I was at Comic-Con, and uh, have you ever been, have you ever been to Comic-Con? Just me. Okay. It's a few people. You know, it's very crowded. It's very, everything's jammed. Everybody's mingling together pre-COVID. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's hard, you know, once you have something you want to throw away, it's hard to find a garbage can in that place. And each of the garbage clans where you can normally find them is next to where they sell the, the hot dogs and pretzels. So, I, you know, I've got a you know, sort of wrinkled up stuff that I don't want that I'm going to throw away. And I get to this line. There's like a line in front of the, uh, the pretzel place. And people waiting to get their pretzels, and then there's a right behind the line. There's a trash can, and I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna get through there. This big wad of stuff, and get it into that trash can. So I'm waiting for a break in the line to develop, and finally it opens. Ah, my moment. So I shove my hand like this, and this gentleman steps forward. I punch him in the stomach. <laughs> so it's Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> so apparently, I'm destined to assault. <laughs> Directors of one no movie. Other. Right. You know, that's a question I should ask before we quit, is what's going on in the film world, if anything, film uh, and television? Again, I, I, I meant not before, I think, because it's been in, in uh, the, the Sigma Force has been, the entire series, not just one book, the entire series has been an option. Right. Um, and they were just they just renewed the option. I think, I don't know, what, they had, they had they renewed it the last time I was here, <coughs> or was it, it was relatively recently they renewed the option, so they bought another chunk of time. So they seemed very active about wanting to turn it into a... Uh, a series, yes, on television. Like it's going to be a TV series? Yes. Yeah. Probably the terminal list and stuff like that is helping. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I always thought it would be hard to, tr to trim 
a Sigma novel into a two-hour movie. There's just so many yeah. m- moving parts. So to me, it, it made more sense even to, to have it in a serial format. So hopefully we'll see that happen one of these days. Great. How yes, sir. How about Jake Ransom? Any... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> So Jake Ransom, uh, again, it was a, a, I began a sort of a middle school series, um, which they told me once a year is fine. And I gave them two books. And now they said, we want it every six months. I said, well, I can't do it every six months. I've got other contracts. Uh, so, so, well, if you can't do it every six months, let's just wait till you, you can do all six, all five books in the series, and then we will publish them in a six-month schedule. So I've already, a long time ago, wrote Cal- Cauldron of Doom, the third book in the Jane Crow, and it's sitting on my shelf right now. Somebody can read it if they want to, but I still got for still the right four and five. Once it's all done, then we'll repackage it and sell it. It's a deal. By the way, who did the audio to Jake Ransom? He's a little known guy and everybody didn't know him at the time. I didn't even know it at this point. It took someone else alerted me to this fact. It was Pedro Pascal. So the Mandalorian is the one who did the audio of the, the two Jake Ransom novels. Love it. Yes, sir. I hope it's a little better, um, but no, it does not come easier. I wish it did. Um, you know, I, I try to hone my craft. You know, try to get. You know, whenever teach writing, one thing I always, or not teach writing, but ever always ask me, what's the one piece of advice you'd give to a writer, a young writer who's looking to get his, you know, break in the business? I said, well, there's the old adage: you should be writing every day. You need to, to, to practice your craft. You should expect to write a million words before you should expect to be published. Uh, but you should be reading every night and that whatever problem you have during your writing day as your whatever, you know, whether it's how to do dialogue or how to describe a character without having to look in a mirror. Um, when you read at night, you see sort of how another author handles that. It begins to untie that knot. So if you're writing every day and reading every night, your prose is going to get stronger and stronger. I don't understand authors who say, you know, I don't have time to read or I'm afraid to read because I'm going to be influenced. I want to be influenced. I read to be influenced. I want to, to, to keep doing that today is, you know, what tricks are these new authors doing uh, to, to, to create these different scenes or, or what's, you know, that's a cool phrase. I never, I never heard that used that way or the way they're presenting dialogue. I've never seen that before. And so I will, I'll note it down. So then the, maybe in a future novel, I began to incorporate some of that. So again, chat GPT, I should put this online, by the way. Um, there's there, there, that, that, that AI bot that, that can like do produce scientific papers and yeah. fools people. And uh, a friend of mine in Boston um, challenged the chat GPT and said, write a short story about somebody shooting down a weather balloon in the, in the style of James Rollins. And it produced like a three-page little vignette of this happening. I thought, you know, that's that actually does sound a little bit like me. It was creepy. It was really creepy. Wow. All right, one more because we've kept you in these chairs now for an hour and fifteen minutes, and I can see everybody starting to squirm. Let's wind up with you. I would too. I won't resent. Hopefully, he doesn't resent me, so he'll do that. I would love to see this thing. One again, I think that's a really cool movie. It'd be fun to see. Um, what was your first question again? Who's your Who's your favorite character in a series? You have again, to love all your children. Again, again, yes. Each character, you know, I like for different reasons. Uh, it's it's fun having the the puzzle solver of Gray and being you know, being able to play with his uh, his mindset. Uh, but of course, obviously, there's certain characters I do love a lot. I love Tucker and Kane because again, veterinarian. There's a guy working with a dog. Cool. Um, Kowalski uh, first appeared in uh, Ice Hunt, one of my standalone novels. Um, I liked him so much. You know, four books later, I'm thinking, I miss Kowalski. I'm going to recruit him to Sigma. He does not belong there, but I'm going to recruit him to Sigma. Uh, so, so the, you know, he, and he comes. Um, Subterranean. Back to my first book novel that was rejected by 49 different agents. Lissa, my first age, my my editor, uh, picked it up and said, "Hey Jim, uh, this is unpublishable." I thought, "Well, why did you buy it?" He said, "Well, it's unpublishable. I, I, it's a diamond in a rough." 
Uh, between us two, we're going to make this into a wonderful novel. The first thing you have to do, Jim, is again, I told you the gist, the gist of some training is I'm going to take four, char- four or five characters, throw them two miles underneath the earth, throw in some monsters, and shake. Based on the detailed outline, I began writing the novel. So it took them till about page 150 before they got down that hole. And Lissa said, they have to be down that hole by page 50. You need to cut out 100 pages of your first part of your novel. But that's not possible, Lissa. If you want to publish it, it's going to be possible. So I you know, began trimming, tying, tightening it. And look, you know, they're down their hole on page 100. I said 50. All right, trim, 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 trim. Look, they're down the hole on page 80. I said 50. Change font size and change the margins. <laughs> Try to cheat that way. You know, page 65. I said 50, Jim. The last scene that got cut on that book, which I've shared occasionally out there, is where you find out how Kalid got the C4 that he uses to, as, a, as a bomb later on in the story. And he gets delivered to his hotel by this Eurasian assassin, uh, very deadly, very scary, and she has a little dragon pendant that she wears. That was Seishan. So she ended up being cut out of subterranean ended up on the cutting room floor, but I liked Seishan, so it took again until Map of Bones for Seishan to reappear in the story. So certain characters just stick with me that I just uh, can't quite let go of. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Sure. As always, it's been a so real Thank you, pleasure. guys. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate it very much. Is that, what? So, oh, that's, that surprised you. What? So before